Friends, hello, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. It is the second Sunday in Advent, y'all. Whew, the second Sunday in Advent, and we are super glad to see all of you. If you were here last night, I just want to give a shout out and a big thank you to everybody who does anything musical for this place and in this building. Um, you might have graced us last night at Lessons and Carols. It was wonderful. Woo! It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Breck, to Amy, to Becky, to the whole choir, the bell choir, everybody. Um, but we've got a couple of announcements that we want to draw your attention to before we start worship this morning. Do you want to yeah. introduce our guest? Uh, yes, I think uh, Mr. Adamson is in the house. Wait, oh, there you are. <laughs> this Friday, December 9th, we are caroling. Um, so, we're not just caroling, it's also the season of colds and sniffles, which I just got over. <laughs> so we're having some soup to start. Um, so soup starts at 515, we have a fellowship hall. Come with a very hungry belly, uh, we will have lots of soup and bread. And then at 6 p.m., bread. Is going to warm us up so even the rustiest of singers will knock off their rust and we'll be able to go sing some jolly carols. And we'll be putting into groups and caroling throughout the community um, and just having a really good time. So if you have any questions, concerns, ask Chris. He really knows what's going on. You can ask me. I'll pretend to know. Hopefully <laughs> is it not on? Um, it's got to be green. It's got to be green. It was green. It was green. What? Why are the Uh-oh. I'll take it from you. Thank you, sir. Thank Can you, we Mr. give this man a round of applause, please? <laughs> All right. A couple of other things. Uh, the other next week, we will also be hearing for from our outreach from our Christmas offering recipients. Excuse me. So if you are around for the Christian Ed Hour at nine fifteen, uh, Hina Abel, who is a member um, and involved in the Gujranwala Theological Seminary in Pakistan, she will be joining us next week um, at nine fifteen in Fellowship Hall. There'll be goodies and snacks, and we're going to hear a little bit about what the Presbyterian experience is like. Um, in Pakistan as we offer them our, our Christmas gifts this season. So we do hope you will come around for that. What else, Parker? Yeah, I actually wanted to do a kind of lift up a joy. I got to spend the morning with the confirmation and the youth, um, and I led them in Christian formation. And this morning we talked about who your savior is. Uh, we spent a little time talking about characteristics, but we also spent a little time drawing and painting. Um, so if you see them around the church, be uplifting, ask them about what they're thinking about, what they're learning about in confirmation class, because it's so interesting how these kids get to come up with their own beautiful faith statements at the end of the year and get to become members of this church. I just wanted to uplift that. As well, the Posada is coming up next Sunday, um, where we have a baby Jesus, but I think we're looking for some wise men and wise women out there, so everybody, is welcome to come. Mallory, what time is it? Five o'clock in Fellowship Hall. So bring a joyful smile. Get ready to get dressed up. That's my favorite part about Posada. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's it. I think Leslie had something she wanted to. Yeah, just thank you so much, Chris. Just one more announcement. Just one more announcement, recognizing that there are a lot of announcements. Uh, in my uh, first church in Kansas, we had a beautiful organ, but we did not have beautiful pipes. And we joked about the fact that our pipes were not beautiful. Here, we have beautiful organ pipes. It's also true now that our boiler and chiller of our building have beautiful pipes. Woo! Uh, this project is almost complete. 
Your generosity means that we funded a $600,000 project largely in cash. The 2023 budget is to service $1,000 of debt to relieve that project. So just a little year-end gratitude that there are beautiful pipes, a generous congregation, and how much the session and I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. My friends, as we always do, we come to the font because no matter the season, it is this font that holds us. It's God's promises that remain true for us. And so we remember today some members of our church community. We remember Bob Street. Many of you might know Bob. Um, Bob is walking the, the last days of his life. And so we pray for him and we pray for his son, Don, in this time of transition in their lives. Uh, we pray for our own Helen Kovacs, who fell, uh, who broke her wrist and will require surgery. So prayers for Helen. Um, but is being seen by our very own Greg Palm. So that's a good thing. Uh, and then we also, we give thanks for Michelle Lucas because she is coming to the end of a very long, uh, grueling internship and it's finishing up. So we give thanks for you today, friend. Um, but whatever is on your heart and mind today, we come to the font and we say together, welcome, welcome home, home, children, children of, of God. God. Please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship. Today, on the second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. 
Advent is for, for the fumblers and woebegones. It's for people who are ready to give up, those who feel they've lost the light. Advent is for those who are willing to risk traveling in darkness. Advent is when we remember that even in darkness, the light travels towards us. Advent continues here. And you are welcome on the journey. Let us worship God. Thank you. You may be seated. We arrive to the timeless discipline of confession, wherein we turn to ourselves, to our neighbor, to God, refreshing our efforts to live a just and loving life. There's a prayer that we share, followed by the prayers of your own heart and mind. Let's join together. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night can shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you.
Friends, the good gifts that arrive to us from God, grace, mercy, peace, redemption, these things cannot be held to ourselves. So we take a minute in our worship services to extend the peace of Christ to one another, that we may be queued up to share it all week long in right ways. The peace of Christ be with each one of you. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace, Spain. Peace of Christ. Missing you guys today, so I'm coming over. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. As we continue greeting one another, there is the opportunity to invite our children forward for some time together. We'll sing them forward now. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, Christ in the face of those who love me. Thanks, you may be seated. Last week, we talked about the emoji of happiness. This week, we are going to talk about a very different emoji. No! What emoji is this one? Can you guess? Uh, it does look a little surprised, but notice the eyebrows confused. I thought somebody would say, this person is sick. They're green. Why did I say that? Because it's green and yellow. Be because it's green. In fact, this emoji is green with envy. envy. What is envy? Envy is when I look at Kate's dress and I think, ooh, I would like to have that dress. Oh, right, exactly. Or I look at someone else's car and I think, ooh, maybe, maybe, um, where is, maybe I look at Laurel and Hodgson's car ooh. and I say, oh, I would love to have that car or someone's eyes. Envy is the way we look around our world. Uh, Yaya, would you start passing out the teacups? Uh, envy is the way we look around our world and we say, ooh, I really like that and I really like this. And envy is a really important emotion because it causes us to recognize what we do not have and what another person has. But it's a very difficult emotion because, shall I give you the first pour? Yes, here you go, JJ. You do not have a cup. Do we have? Oh, we've got some more. We've got some more? Yeah. Now, what we're doing, for those of you that have not been with us, is that we are toasting our emotions. So we're using the historic silver of the congregation to practice the etiquette of toasting. And toasting is when we raise our glass and we say to something, you're really important. Nice. Great reach there, Teresa. Thank you. And so sometimes people talk about emotions like anger or envy and say you shouldn't have them. But they are God-given emotions and they are very important. So are you ready to toast envy? All right, so we raise our cups. We say, Envy, thanks for coming. Envy, thanks for coming. You remind me that other people are beautiful. And so am I. Here we go. Take a drink. Wonderful, you guys. And just remember, next time you feel envious, totally normal. 
and the cue for you to look at your own beautiful self because others sometimes look at us green with envy. You guys, let's stand up and say our prayer. You can hold your cup, you can put it down, you can't make a mistake. Ready? Let's face this good congregation. They've never been jealous of anyone. None of them, none of them. I'm sure, Jacob, let's look out at their faces and see. God be in my, God be in my heart. God be on my left, God be on my right. God be beneath me, God be above me. God be in the faces of all who love me. Perfect, thank you, sir. Thanks, Yaya, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Parker, I'll grab them. No, it's okay. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> Friends, before our Old Testament scripture reading today, will you join me in a moment of prayer? Eternal God, who arrives to our senses, who arrives in this place, enveloping, claiming us, and shining bright upon us, allow in these moments that the things that weigh heavy on us are lifted up, the things that are on our mind fall away, so that as the word is proclaimed, sung, and spoken, that we hear, that we listen, that we engage with. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Friends, our reading today might sound similar if you came last night. It's a similar passage, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Listen now for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not be judged by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child shall play over the heap of the ass, and the wean child shall put their hand over the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all of my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Friends, this is the word of the Lord.
If you're not already risen up in body or in spirit, I invite you to rise up now for the reading of the gospel in either body or spirit, a reading from the third chapter of the gospel of Matthew, verses 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, Quote, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, end quote. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for the repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but to the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thanks, you may be seated. Well, Barbara Brown Taylor is a professor, a preacher, and a writer. Uh, Barbara says that every Advent season is like taking off into an airplane in turbulent weather. Maybe you have done your fair share of flying, and maybe you, like me, enjoy those flights where it's just smooth sailing, where you take off and those wheels leave the ground and you, and you leave the world behind you and you coast seamlessly up to your altitude of 30,000 feet. But then maybe every now and again, you're going and taxiing out onto that runway and as you make that last turn onto that long, long concrete runway where you will take off, the pilot comes on the intercom. Buckle your seatbelt, the captain says. We're in for some bumps. And friends, let me tell you, there is nothing like a bumpy ride at 30,000 feet in nothing but an aluminum tube to teach you and me how to pray. Well, the lectionary for Advent, the lectionary is the calendar that the church sometimes uses uh, for scripture passages, that it takes us through some turbulence before it allows us to get up to the glories of Christmas. That before the all is merry and bright of the Christmas season, before the stillness and the candlelight of Christmas Eve, we have to pass through the bumps. We're in for some turbulence, the captain says. And so maybe last week you were here and you entered into a beautifully decorated Christmas sanctuary with wise men and wreaths. And then we heard Jesus talking about the end times. We heard him talking about the temple that would fall down and be raised up again in three days. We heard about war and rumors of war. 
And now this week, we meet somewhat of an unsightly figure. We meet John the Baptist, who has slithered onto stage right, wearing animal skin, eating bugs, and talking about unquenchable fire. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Do you feel those bumps yet? But it's okay, because like any good captain says on that intercom, is that this plane was built for turbulence. And now maybe you've listened to the gospel this morning and you've thought to yourself that John just kind of sounds like a bit of a Scrooge character. He's high on judgment. He's low on empathy. And maybe I'll submit to you that you might be half right. But let me tell you a secret that you might already know. And that's that every single gospel writer in the Bible Every single gospel writer begins Jesus's ministry with words from John the Baptist. That in some way, shape, or form, the early Christians, when they heard the promises and the baptisms of John, they didn't just hear words of mindless judgment, but they heard something of hope, something of newness, something of promise. And so there's John sitting out on the margins of society in the wilderness, standing by a riverbank. And he preaches a message of repentance and invitation. Come! Well, don't just sit there. Look up! Turn around. Repent. Because God's coming towards you. And we're told that his promise, his message of newness must have caught on because hordes of people just came out of the woodwork just so they could be baptized on the banks of the Jordan River. That something new was on the horizon. And for those early followers, that word repentance, maybe it didn't chafe against their ears like it does for ours today. You know, a friend of mine actually told me that in St. Luke's Gospel, they call this, they call repentance good news. Good news. Well, I wonder if for some of us, the word repentance can conjure up some pretty nasty images. Uh, Turn or burn, as maybe you've heard before. Maybe we think of street preachers heralding the end of the world. Maybe it's not exactly what John means, but maybe it's what we think. Maybe you've seen the movie Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. And there's this amazing scene where a young poet talks about a sweaty-toothed madman who mumbles truth, truth like a blanket that will always leave your feet cold. Maybe that's what we think John is, just a sweaty tooth madman. Maybe repentance is something that never quite delivers on its promise. Maybe it is just an archaic artifact of a time gone by, and maybe we would just be better without it now. Something that promises warmth and health, but at the end of the day will always leave our feet cold. Well, Shannon Kirshner is a Presbyterian pastor and preacher up in Chicago. She's somewhat of a big deal in the Presbyterian church. She's the pastor of Fourth Presbyterian Church, which has been rated by scholars as the second most beautiful church in America, except for First Presbyterian Church of Waco. And maybe the most interesting thing about Shannon isn't her, her, her extensive resume— the way that she's a leader in our denomination, but maybe the most important thing you need to know about Shannon is that she's a child of this church. Hallelujah. That Shannon grew up in this youth group, and she wrote something about John's words in this passage that have stayed with me over the days. Repentance, she says, it's not just about behavior modification. It's not just about changing who you are or willing yourself into a new life, but repentance is always tied for John into a deeper and a more Jewish idea. That John sitting out in the wilderness covered in animal skins and eating only the things that the earth would naturally give him, that he would remind us of a time when we felt far off when we felt far from the center, when we felt isolated, maybe even done in. And if you were a Jew, he would have reminded you of the exile. 
of the time when you had been taken from your home, where you could no longer celebrate your religious customs and where your neighbors were no longer your neighbors. And so Shannon writes this about this passage. She says, to repent means to return from exile. To repent means to come again into God's presence. That repentance isn't just about altering the person you are, but repentance is about preparing to come home. It's an invitation, not a threat. I think she's right. You see, John likes to quote from the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. But this is not just some solemn spectacle for the holier than thou's, but it is a homecoming parade where people are dancing through the streets, where the Jewish people were again allowed to come back into their homeland. That according to Isaiah, that every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain shall be made low, and even the uneven ground shall be made flat. Even the land upon which they walk bends and twists to welcome the people of Israel back to the promised land. The imagery that the prophet uses is not that of behavior modification. It is not that of, well, if only you just would have gotten it right back then. But the image that the prophet uses is of merriment and jubilation. There's dancing in the streets. Homes will be filled with friends feasting together. We're going home, the prophet says. Good news of expectation, because with God, even the most desolate and lifeless places can breathe once again. And so we find John sitting out there on the fringes of society, away from the traditional structures of power and privilege of how things just should be, and he's getting the people ready to start that parade back home. And everyone's got a ticket to ride. But then come the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And now we need to pause here, because I don't know if you're on Twitter or not, but maybe you know that anti-Semitism continues to rage throughout this world. That we need to be very careful not to think that John is pointing out the Jewish people to be the object of God's dissatisfaction that all the people in this scene are Jewish. And it's not actually very clear what kind of beef John has with those Pharisees and Sadducees, but I want to venture a guess for his harsh words that are pointed at those cultural leaders. I think it has something to do with powerful figures who thought that they were just already a part of the in-group that John seems to have little time for religious people who themselves think of them as, as immune to the turbulent patterns of the world. But I've still struggled with these words. And yet somewhere under the anger, I think there might be a message for us today. I think it's this. That you see, the thing about grace is that you can't deserve it or it's not really grace. And contrary to these religious leaders who seem to have somehow thought that the rules of the game just bent in their favor, disproportionately so, that John takes a radical different, a radically different path. That John shows humility and he shows gratitude. You see, the one who comes after me, John says, well, I'm not even unworthy to hold his shoes, and yet he's still going to come to us. And he will baptize you in ways that you can hardly even imagine. For with me, I might dunk you in some water, but for him, well, he'll give you new life. Friends, gratitude is powerful. Gratitude is palpable. Gratitude is bewildering. And maybe the opposite of gratitude isn't just thanklessness, but maybe it's resentment. 
Because think about this for just a moment. Maybe at their root, gratitude and resentment say the same thing to us, but in totally opposite ways. That both gratitude and resentment say this to you. They say, well, the world just hasn't given you what you deserve. And so resentment looks at you and it says, you know, the world's really just not given you what you deserve. And yeah, there's good things in the world, but they're always out there somewhere. Everybody else always has those good things, but never you. But maybe gratitude looks at the world. And maybe gratitude says to you, you know, the world has given you just so much more than you could ever deserve. That God has given you just so much more than you could ever deserve. And so there stands our lonely Baptist out on the fringes yelling about repentance. Do we still feel like we're flying through turbulent air? But maybe what he's saying to us is this. Join the parade. Look up, turn around, repent, come home. Because there's still room for you. Can we hear him? Friends, there's a ticket for each and every one of you on that Advent parade this season. And all that's required, I think, is a grateful heart. Maybe it's the wonder of this season that somehow has a way of moving us from resentment, from cynicism, and into gratitude. Because they can hold us pretty tightly, can't they? And now maybe what I just said sounded like it should be on a Hallmark card. Give yourself to the wonder of the season. But I'm not talking about presents or lights or ornaments or trees. You see, I think John is on the right track. Because after every present has been wrapped, after every light has been hung, after every tree has been put up, there is still a truth and a promise and an expectation. That one is coming. We are not even worthy to carry his shoes. But he still comes. So repent. Turn around. Look up. Stay awake. Because God is coming towards you. And this Advent, we're headed home. Amen. Friends, now that the word has been proclaimed, will you join with me together to affirm our faith and say what we believe? I believe in, oh yes, please rise. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. <clears throat> It is at this moment where our gifts and our gratitude meet each other. They intersect and is where we can realize that we have so much to give of ourselves, whether that be monetarily, whether that be time, whether that be kind words. So I invite our ushers forward as we try to think and aspire to be gracious.
Let us pray. God of all peoples, a great irony within the season is we pause just to bring our mindfulness to a focus that our actions may give glory to you. The drudgery of the season, what it means to pull a dusty box from a shelf, to untangle lights, to rearrange the furniture, these ordinary middle-class realities of Advent allow us profound moments with the bigger struggles of humanity. To pull that dusty box and to sort and discard what is no longer life-giving. To clean off and freshly display what inspires. To manage the tangled lights, to find the shortages within the strand that brings power and illumination to the environment around. To shift the arrangement of our living so that space may be made for the arrivals of our family and our friend and of the divine presence in which we trust so profoundly. May our ordinary duties give rise to the extraordinary ends of your kingdom. These things we pray as we remember the prayer that Christ set in motion, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And in that spirit, you and I retain a privilege that we would move out into the world in peace that has always required courage, that we would hold fast to what is good, that we would return no person evil for evil, that we would strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, and in so doing, honor all people, loving and serving the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, you are all invited to stay for Coffee Fellowship afterwards. We're really thankful for Bob and Nancy Grayson for putting together a feast for us. So stay for some goodies afterwards. Any of it and all of it is possible because there is a God who walks beside us and with us and near us at all times. So go, turn around, look up, repent. God is coming towards you and we're going home. Amen. Ha, <laughs> ha, 